Hello and welcome to Timmy Mac Politics with me, Mr. McClellan. We are going to look at the question as to whether the European Union has a democratic deficit. This is a really common accusation levelled at the European Union and therefore we will test the validity of it. Now, this is also a really common question that appears in the politics exam and in my experience students don't focus and do too well when it comes to questions on the European Union. In fact, students tend to steer clear of these questions. I do think they believe that they are overly technical in terms of the answer that they have to give, but when they feel perhaps compelled to answer a question on the European Union, they don't do too well at it. So hopefully this video and all this content will improve the outcomes for students when it comes to the European Union and in particular looking at the question as to whether it has a democratic deficit. Now let's begin with a bit of an introductory section by mentioning that the European Economic Community was established by the Treaty of Rome 1957 and the EEC was very much the forerunner of the modern day the European Union which of course we have today. Now as the name suggests the European Economic Community had an economic intent. The six countries which were the original signatories of the Treaty of Rome were intent on binding their economies so as to avoid another major conflict happening on European soil. So the six original signatories were France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Italy and also West Germany. Yes, Germany was divided into West and East in those days so it was West Germany that was an original signatory of the Treaty of Rome. They wanted to become more reliant, economically speaking, and also to improve their economic outcomes. And the side effect, of course, was to avoid another world war on European soil, uh, to which the European Union has been remarkably successful. Now, the European Economic Community, it evolved, it changed, of course, as all these international organisations do. And indeed, it changed rather significantly as a result of the Maastricht Treaty of 1992, Maastricht being a city in the Netherlands. And really at that point, the role of the European Union had become as much political as well as economic. And really the Maastricht Treaty enshrined the name change, the European Union came into being from the EEC, but its role had expanded to become as much political. The European Union was getting involved in home affairs, foreign policy, security and justice policy, and therefore its power and influence had grown, which therefore led greater credence really to the accusation that there was a democratic deficit at the heart of the European project, okay, because of its expanded power. Therefore, is there sufficient democratic accountability within the institutions of the European Union? And I've selected the four main institutions of the European Union to focus on when it comes to the charge of democratic deficit within them. Now, you may get a question in the exam which talks about the European Union as a whole. It may even reference some of these four main institutions, but whatever the statement in the question uh, delivers to you, do make sure, I would suggest, to divide your answer into the component parts, those four main institutions of the European Union. I think it's a nice way to structure your answer and indeed the level of democratic deficit, if one indeed exists in the European Union, is different in each of these four institutions. So therefore you can see the logic as to why I've selected those four by way of your essay structure. Now, let's look at the four that we're going to focus on. We've got the European Commission, we've got the Council of the European Union, we've got the European Council, not to be confused, who said the EU was complex, and then the European Parliament, okay? So we will look at each of those in turn. Let's begin with the European Commission, this supranational executive body. Supranational meaning that its power transcends national borders, and indeed executive meaning that it executes and enforces laws, EU law, obviously. Um, it is based in Brussels, hence the Brussels bashing that goes on, particularly with respect to the European Commission. It probably bears the brunt of much of the criticism that is directed towards the European Union. It is a hugely bureaucratic civil service based in Brussels, employing 32,000 people. So it is 
a very complicated institution which tends to lend itself to the exact accusation that there is a democratic deficit at the heart of the European Union and indeed it is not directly elected okay that said uh, I don't know of a civil service that is directly elected and that of course is the point of a civil service at least in comparison to Britain's civil service which the three pillars are independent permanent and uh, not elected okay uh, anonymous in other words okay um, so therefore, yes, there is credibility the, to the accusation that there is a democratic deficit within the European Commission. But then what civil service has much democratic accountability? That's the very essence of a civil service. And I don't think the European Commission is much different than that. Although you could argue that its complexity is much more, much greater than all other civil services around the world. Now... When it comes to the electoral elements, the elected elements of the European Commission, they do exist. So even though it's not directly elected, there are elected elements within it. For example, the president of the European Commission is directly elected to serve a five-year term. And indeed, the election is carried out by the European Parliament, which itself is directly elected. We will come to the Parliament later, but they effectively choose the European Commission President, who, at the time of speaking in 2020, is a lady called Ursula von der Leyen, a German citizen who made waves in Angela Merkel's government. She was elected by the European Parliament to the presidency of the European Commission, and it is a job which has significant powers associated with it. She is an international politician of significant standing, okay? Moving on from the president, who is elected, oh, by the way, she is nominated by the European Council, okay? So they put her name forward and the parliament elected her. There is democratic measures in place there. Now, the 27 commissioners that make up the European Commission, these are selected by each member state of the European Union, hence why there are 27 of them, okay? But again, even though the member states appoint, uh, effectively, or nominate, I should say, each commissioner, they are elected to a five-year term, again, by the Parliament, okay? Once more, the European Parliament is directly elected, and they have a say in whether the 27 commissioners are indeed elected themselves, okay? And incidentally, three were rejected in 2019. So this is not a foregone conclusion that just because you are nominated by your member state to be one of the 27 European commissioners within the European Commission, that doesn't mean you will have a job uh, as a given. Certainly not, three were rejected in 2019, okay? So, again, democratic accountability appears to be present even in the civil service of the European Commission. Um, in terms of the power of the European Commission, it is considered to be a powerful organisation. It drafts and executes legislation and it handles the budget of the European Union, which comes in at roughly 150 billion euros. Sounds like an awful lot of money. It is an awful lot of money, of course. However, it does represent only 2% of the public spending of all EU member states. So in relatively terms, um, it is rather small uh, in comparison to other budgets uh, within member states, you know, health and education and all the others, okay? Having said that, there are numerous complaints from certain countries within the European Union, and of course this is one of the major complaints delivered from Britain, that some countries do better out of the EU budget than others. Britain always used to argue, or at least Eurosceptics used to argue, that it was a net contributor to the EU budget and therefore it would put in more than it would directly get back. And it's very difficult to uh, countenance um, that particular uh, accusation that some countries uh, do get less, if you like, from the EU budget than others, okay? Um, the argument by Europhiles would be, of course, that Britain would get indirect benefits, which are very difficult to measure, um, but really that doesn't hold as much weight when you look at the figures going one way and the amount of money that is coming back to you when the European Commission dishes out the budget into its various pots 
going to the various member states. Many Eurosceptics felt Britain didn't do too well out of that. And there was very little that British people could do about it because of the democratic deficit uh, at the heart of the European Commission itself. Now, moving on to our next institution, we've got the Council of the European Union. This was formerly known as the Council of Ministers. Indeed, it is an intergovernmental body, figures from the different governments, the different member states working together, and it is comprised of ministers elected by the states to coordinate policy. The Council of the European Union is considered to be the main decision-making body of the European Union. And indeed, the ministers that sit there, whether they've been ministers for agriculture, economic affairs, home affairs, it does depend upon the topic of discussion at the time when they meet regularly, uh, but they are elected. They're not directly elected to the Council of the European Union, but they must have surely have had to have passed uh, an electoral test within their member states. They are ministers, but they're likely to be members of parliament or some other elected body within the member states, and therefore they have to pass an electoral test to make it into the Council of the European Union. So there is an element, of course, of democracy there. Now, in terms of the power of the Council of the European Union, it shares legislative power and budget approval with the Parliament, okay? So, main decision-making body, but doesn't pass the laws by itself. It shares the lawmaking powers with the direct elected Parliament. There it is again. And indeed, it must approve the budget with the Parliament. And indeed, there's an awful lot of negotiation when it comes to budget approval within the European Union, a very contentious topic. But that particular approval of the budget is shared by the Council of the European Union and the directly elected Parliament. OK, um, the way in which the Council of the European Union works in practice is that it likes to reach consensus in terms of its decision making. OK, it seeks agreement between all the member states of the European Union. It does like unanimity with all its decision making. So all states to agree effectively. Now, that seems great in practice, but in order to achieve that, an awful lot of compromise has to be found. And whenever you get compromise, you may get too much compromise. And therefore, some member states and indeed some people may think that their particular wishes, their goals, their aims that they wanted to achieve have become so watered down with compromise that they're really uh, not worth the paper that they are now written on, okay? So therefore, yeah, in theory, consensus and total agreement is a good thing. But having said that, many people, many member states on occasion feel that they're not getting really the essence of what they want from meetings of the Council of the European Union. That said as well, when it comes to the most sensitive topics, absolute agreement is sought and states can veto uh, certain policies that maybe the majority of the European Union, uh, uh, the Council of the European Union wants to pass. However, unless there is total agreement on certain sensitive topics, perhaps on immigration, which of course is a major and sensitive topic at the heart of the EU at the moment, well, decisions won't be made because states do have a veto. When it comes to most decisions that are taken in the Council of the European Union, it is done on the basis of QMV, Qualified Majority Voting, okay? So the voting itself is democratic, but it is rather complex and it is rather unusual as well. This is how it works. If you wanna get a decision passed by the Council of the European Union, 55% of member states have to agree. And by my calculations, that means 15 states out of the 27 must agree to a particular decision. And, you know, that gives an element of a safety net to the smaller member states of the European Union, a Luxembourg or a Cyprus, perhaps, who feels that their votes count equally as the bigger players, an Italy, a France, a Germany, perhaps. So a nice levelling of the playing field there within the EU. Having said that, the bigger players do get to have an element more of influence when it comes to this next provision of qualified majority voting. And it's that the 
of states to vote in favour of a policy must represent 65% of the EU population. And therefore you can see the influence of Germany's much greater population, same with Italy, same with France, holding sway when it comes to that element of QMV. The hope and the intention is, though, that no state feels ignored, no state feels sidelined when it comes to decision-making in the Council of the European Union. Having said that, as with any democratic measure, no state may get completely what it wants, OK? Some states may feel that their wishes are somewhat thwarted as a result of QMV. Also, uh, adding greater weight to the accusation that there is a democratic deficit within the Council of the European Union is that it used to carry out its business in secret. That has now changed. The Lisbon Treaty of 2007 made the Council of the European Union much more transparent. And here's a specific example. It allowed for the provision of an early warning system whereby national parliaments could comment on some of the proposals of the Council of the European Union and therefore national politicians could therefore have somewhat of a say as to the discussion as to what was going on in the Council of the European Union. So a nice example there of the democratic accountability uh, at least given by the early warning system. It has to be said though that the ministers within the Council of the European Union could just ignore the comments made by national parliaments. Moving on to the European Council, relatively straightforward institution, this is in terms of its membership, it's the elected heads of government uh, from each of the member states. It meets roughly four times a year and of course they offer strategic direction to the European Union. They very much set the agenda, they are the elected heads of government from the member states. So. Lots of democratic accountability there, uh, and equally these uh, elected heads of government are of course conscious of national public opinion. Having said that, when it comes to treaty change, that most contentious of issues at the European Union, well, many citizens can feel sidelined even by their own heads of government, whom they well have elected. So, as an example of the treaties which have reorganised the European Union, we've got the Maastricht Treaty of 1992, we've got the Amsterdam Treaty of 97, we've got Nice of 2004 and the Lisbon Treaty of 2007. All of those treaties were designed to reorganise, repackage the EU to make it much more effective uh, and efficient in terms of what it does as perhaps its role and influence has expanded. It has certainly got larger in terms of the member states that are now a part of it. So therefore you have this reorganisation as delivered by treaty change. Having said that though, many ordinary citizens, particularly the Eurosceptics of course, within various countries, feel that they don't really know the detail within these treaties and indeed certain proposals at the heart of these treaties are indeed very controversial. No more so than the proposed constitution of the European Union, which was indeed rejected in 2004 and 2007 as a result of national referenda in the Netherlands and indeed in France, okay? So really the European Union seems to kind of get treaty change done sometimes through the back door, but having said that, even elected heads of government may feel accountable to their national electorates when it comes to the most contentious of decisions. And I don't think you can get any more contentious than a written codified constitution, a bit like a United States of Europe that was proposed by the constitution in the early 2000s. Equally now, I think national politicians within the European Council will be very aware of the impact of Brexit. If people of a particular country don't like the European project, well, they may force your hand uh, and get you to leave or get the country to leave the European Union, as has occurred with Brexit in 2016. You could look that at the other way, of course, because Brexit has hardly been a seamless transition for the UK in terms of getting out of the European Union, okay? And then the final uh, institution that we'll look at, guys, is the European Parliament. It is directly elected in a very democratic method, employing proportional representation, and indeed MEPs, members of the European Parliament, are elected for a five-year term. The elections of MEPs, well, they're based on population size, so Germany gets 96 MEPs, Little Old Malta only gets six, 
But indeed, when it comes to MEPs and the way that they work, they don't tend to stick together based on national allegiance. They tend to focus on ideological uh, allegiances. Okay, so left wing MEPs tend to stick together and vote accordingly. And the same is true for right wing MEPs and everyone else in between, if you like. Okay, the biggest problem with the direct election of MEPs is that the turnout is incredibly low, only at 50% in 2019. And that's actually rather high in comparison to previous European elections. And that, of course, questions the legitimacy of the MEPs who make decisions on our behalf. The power of the European Parliament, well, it approves the budget. It is a co-legislator with the Council of the European Union. It can amend, veto, but not initiate legislation, OK? But it does have significant legislative power. And indeed, the influence of the European Parliament has grown as a result of the Single European Act 1986, which is effectively another treaty of the European Union. And actually, the Single European Act increased the power of the European Parliament insofar it could question or allow MEPs to question uh, the roles and functions more uh, pertinently of the Council of the European Union in particular, okay, and actually send back proposals to the Council of the European Union uh, for for further amendments, if you like, okay. So there has been increasing power for the Parliament, and that's probably the EU recognising that it has been uh, somewhat suspect um, to the jibe of there being a democratic deficit and a way to kind of counter that criticism is to give the unquestionably democratic institution at the heart of the EU more power, okay? Again, now to counter that argument, well, who is your MP? Can you name a single MEP in your country? I've always struggled to as a politics teacher and I think many ordinary citizens will be uh, unable indeed to do that. Uh, and I just would question sometimes who these people are, okay? And I've found some examples whereby Mussolini's granddaughter, who didn't appear to renounce fascism uh, based on the research that I uh, conducted, she was an MEP. And I also find an example of a Holocaust denier um, insofar as this particular MEP questioned whether Adolf Hitler knew about the Holocaust, okay? So there are some interesting characters who are MEPs. I think the main point we can make here though is, do people know who their MEP is? They do appear rather distant from the electorate. And then finally, guys, by way of a conclusion, well, it's fair to say that this notion of a democratic deficit being at the heart of the EU, there does appear to be uh, a louder voice in terms of that criticism when it is the EU being embroiled in a time of crisis and I think it has suffered from that recently with Brexit in fact and also the Eurozone debt crisis and the migration crisis that followed that. So the criticism of democratic deficit does appear to be louder when the EU is going through tough times. That has led to the rise of populist politicians, Nigel Farage in the UK context of course, almost forcing the hand of David Cameron's Conservative government with the Brexit referendum. We've got Matteo Salvini, who was elected to the position of uh, Demo uh, Deputy Prime Minister in Italy, leader of the uh, somewhat controversial Northern League in Italy. And then we've got the president of Hungary, Viktor Orban, who, from his statements, is no friend of the European Union, although he's not decided to drag Hungary out of the European Union full of rhetoric, but very much a nationalist politician, as indeed I think it's fair to say these guys all are, okay? So the fact that these guys have risen to positions of prominence probably shows you that there is an element of uh, credibility to this particular criticism, okay? People are buying into that criticism. Having said that, there is democracy within the EU, we focused on that, uh, and also there is a democratic uh, method, a directly democratic method in the form of the European Citizens Initiative and this allows European citizens, provided they number one million, to actually provoke, propose legislation to the European Commission. So a nice niche example you can throw in there of direct democracy at the heart of the EU. Ultimately though, sovereignty rests with states. They can be a member of the EU or they can choose not to be. And indeed, they set the rules of the game within the EU. Uh, the book stops with elected politicians, not necessarily with the Commission, but with elected heads of states and ministers. It does depend on, though, 
what your democratic perspective is. Democracy for one person is different to another person. This may not be a much this may not be much democracy for people, it may be too much for others. It just depends on your perspective and a nice way to finish on that rather philosophical question. Hopefully that was useful for you. Thank you very much.